Good evening and welcome to the Government of Jersey St. Helier's Studio for the fifth edition of Ask the Ministers. This is the first of two special panel sessions focusing on the government plan. Tonight we'll be hearing from the Chief Minister plus four ministers or assistant ministers who are here to answer your questions on government finances, healthcare and COVID-19 and putting children first. There's plenty to talk about over the next 90 minutes so it'll be over to you to Ask the Ministers. Good evening and welcome to Ask the Ministers. My name is Chris Rayner and I was a broadcaster and journalist for many years. Tonight is the first of two special panel sessions where we will be discussing the forthcoming government plan. This document was published a month ago and it aims to bring together the government's income and spending plans for 2022 to 2025. Included are the usual budget measures, but there are also the plans for how the government will intend to work towards its strategic policies, how the money will be raised, what the current state of their finances are, and how the government will spend your money. Essentially, it's an update on how things are going and what's changed or are due to change. One thing that will definitely change next year is the political leadership as we enter 2022 and the countdown to elections. Tonight will be split into three chunks lasting approximately half an hour each. The first will be government finances. Then we will look at healthcare and COVID-19 and we'll finish by discussing putting children first. Some introductions now. To my right is the Chief Minister, Senator John LaFondre, who will be with us throughout this evening. We'll also be joined by Assistant Minister for Treasury and Resources, Deputy Lindsay Ash, Minister for Health and Social Services, Deputy Richard Renoff, the Minister for Education, Deputy Scott Wickenden, and also will be joining us Assistant Minister for Mental Health, Deputy Trevor Poynton. There will be some short videos uh, while we swap um, our panellists around. So please, if you haven't already put your questions through, you can do so by using www.slido.com and the hashtag Ask the Ministers. There is a function on there that, uh, where you can vote up, well, upvote questions so that the most popular ones get asked first. So please send in your questions and I'll do my best to try and make sure they are asked. How they're answered though, of course, uh, will be down to our panel. But first, a short video. In this year's government plan, we're focusing on recovery and renewal for islanders and our economy. We're looking at the long-term sustainability of government finances, which will enable us to build a better future together. We'll continue to support our business community through the range of measures that have been in place for some time now and will respond to changing circumstances as required. Our finances will be run at a deficit until we begin to see recovery, but we intend to return to balanced budgets over the period of this plan. We'll also continue to invest in our public services and our common strategic priorities through savings and efficiencies. Islanders can be assured that they will not see any severe cuts to spending or significant increases in taxes to cover the deficits. Our commitment has always been to improve the services we provide, to deal with the big legacy issues we have inherited, but also to remain committed to sustainable public finances, including continued savings. It follows, in general, the strategies we laid out when we took office, but also contains plans for recovering from the pandemic, both financially and socially. It sets out how we propose to pay for everything, including the impact of COVID-19, major projects such as the hospital, and continues to make long-term changes to address a number of the legacy issues we inherited. As a Council of Ministers, we are committed to long-term planning, building foundations that will benefit not only islanders living and working now, but the generations that will follow them. And whilst we have had and continue to face many hurdles on this path, I believe we have kept our promise to you. Thank you for listening. Welcome back. 
Over the next 90 minutes, we'll be talking about the government plan and uh, under three headings, government finances for the first 30 minutes, healthcare and COVID-19 and putting children first. So if you do have some questions on those for our panel, please go on to slido.com and use the hashtag Ask the Ministers. Um, I'm going to kick things off uh, by speaking to um, the Chief Minister who's sitting to my right, and he'll be here throughout uh, this evening. Um, I was looking at your government plan forward earlier on this afternoon, Chief Minister, and you state there... The financial position for the government is in a better place than anticipated. Um, at the start of this year, I think you say there was around 300, it was around 300 million pounds higher than it was at the end of 2019. I know we've got some clever accountants here, um, perhaps in this room as well, but how did you get that figure, given the massive impacts of the COVID pandemic? Well, essentially the reserve, so uh, the reserves, basically the ones I've we took into account there were the Social Security Reserve Fund and the Strategic Reserve. And essentially, the values on those reserves have gone up by £300 million. Pounds. So it's pure, very simple maths. doesn't require an accountant to work that one out. Um, and it does demonstrate that actually, although we have spent a lot of money, to be clear, um, it was actually less than we projected. The way we've dealt with it, I would suggest, has been pretty considered, has been careful. And we have a plan, therefore, although we have debt, uh, in relation to COVID, it's less debt than we were forecasting. We have a plan to repay that debt without putting taxes up. And actually, uh, that plan, which was when we've shifted everybody to a current year basis of taxation, it's a bit of a technical argument, it generates a one-off lump sum of cash. It doesn't increase. Uh, I will pay the same amount of tax in my lifetime. I'll just pay it at a different time. Um, and um, uh, what that will do, actually, it will generate more cash in the present projections on the COVID debt. So that balance can actually go either into the reserves or, for example, towards the hospital or whatever a future assembly slash council ministers decides. So I think we've actually, we've been able to use our position. Uh, we've able to use, if you like, uh, be slightly innovative in how we funded things. And that is the nature of Jersey. And I think we played to that innovative in how we funded things. And that is the nature of Jersey. And I think we played to that, that strength very well. Was that the plan? Was that the plan when you set out to restructure taxation? Well, actually, if or was you it just fall into your lap. No, if you uh, thank you for asking that. Actually, I think if you go back to a corporate services scrutiny panel recommendation, I'm going to say of 2015 or 2017, um, when there was another uh, well, there's the same accountant uh, chairing that at the time, and we actually put a recommendation in, which was accepted by Treasury of the day, that we look at moving people to a current year basis, uh, because we did identify that it would. Uh, generate a sum of money. And that's been proven to be the case. Um, obviously, we weren't projecting uh, having a pandemic, but that kind of uh, being prepared to take those difficult decisions has actually, I would suggest, uh, left the island in a good place. Sometimes they're not popular decisions in the short term, but that's really been uh, one of the, the narratives of this government, is we're prepared to take those difficult decisions and look at the long-term uh, issues that we've been trying to deal with. Okay, so you have planned for that, but I mean, there's always the thing with budgets, and the Assistant Treasury Minister will no doubt um, uh, like to answer a little bit of this as well. You still clobber people every year for AMPO duties, for example. You still use that as a lever to raise money. Yeah, I mean, it's always been so. Actually, if you look at the, um, and, and, and Lindsay, we're pretty delighted to come on shore. We've not put up all AMPOs, so, um, uh, and I'll leave Lindsay to do the detail on that. Um, but we have generally put increases up around um, where you are trying to incentivize and, and give a slight nudge about changing behavior, so smoking, for example. Um, but equally, uh, allowances go up, <coughs> and uh, this is not the right way to put it, but the, um, the amount of money that will go out on allowances will be greater than the amount of money we bring in on AMPO. So it depends what your behavior is as to whether... You, um, you know, you, you, at to what level you're impacted by those, uh, by those measures. Let's be clear, many other governments are putting up taxation to pay for COVID. We've all, all, all we have done is put up some measures around uh, effectively AMPO and duties. I'm trying to keep it simple. Lindsay. Well, uh, the AMPO is always a, an interesting one. It divides into several areas, fuel, alcohol. Um, I think it's fair to say that we've tried to keep the alcohol AMPO at reasonable levels throughout our term. 
In fact, the first year we were in government was the first time, well, if memory serves, for 20 years that it hasn't gone up more than inflation. Uh, the second year it did. Uh, last year it didn't go up at all. And this year, um, beer and cider is staying where it is, and wines and spirits have gone up. Um, people see the prices going up more, but I think it's important to recognise this. And I, it took me a while in government to know it, and it was explained to me by an economist, that if you take out all the tax in uh, Jersey, i.e. that's GST and AMPO duty, and you do the same in the UK, you are left with the average price of a pint of beer, just the beer. And in Jersey, it's a pound more expensive than the UK. So that isn't tax, it's other areas, and I'm very pleased that the competition regulator is going to look into all those areas, transport, etc., to see if there are, are ways that we can combat that. Um, as far as petrol is concerned, obviously that's one that's always um, a hot potato. Um, one of the reasons that's gone up more than perhaps it normally would is because a certain amount of that now goes towards the fund to uh, combat climate change, which was voted through by the Assembly, so we as a Treasury Department um, go along with that recommendation. I was just going to ask you there, is enough going through to that? It's, what is it, 3p in uh, the, that you collect from um, AMPO is going towards the Climate Fund? With the, with the petrol at the moment, obviously, uh, Chris, it's a, it's a difficult balancing act, isn't it? It's, we don't want to push petrol up way too much because it fuels other things such as inflation, but we do have to go along with the state's assembly recommendation, which is to build that fund up. Are you looking ahead as more people switch to electric vehicles, as we've been hearing recently? And, and are you looking ahead at where you can get that money you get now from fuel duty well, in the I've, future? Well, I've long been of the opinion that um, if we... Uh, and the figures have changed slightly now because we've got different things going on. But initially when I started doing this job, I think... Um, the petrol tax as such brought in around 21, 22 million pounds. I think it was around that level. Now, obviously, if you take that out completely and you move purely to electric vehicles, which may or may not happen, but it certainly appears that it's headed in that direction, you are looking to find that amount of money. Roads will still need to be done. Uh, they'll need to be lit. They'll need to be resurfaced. So we will need that money to do that. So I think the only way to do that is to put in some form of vehicle tax that if you're driving an electric vehicle, you're still using the roads and the user pays. So uh, that would be the way I would look to go. Last year when you didn't get um, so much from fuel duty because people were driving less, mm -hmm. they had less reason to drive during lockdown, that was um, covered to a certain extent by people not buying duty-free alcohol or cigarettes. So you got that money the equivalent of that money last year, didn't you? So have you used what you learnt last year to, 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 look at, to forecast ahead to what will happen when you have to change mm. some of these AMPO duties? Did you learn um, from that experience? I think you learn, uh, we've learnt, and I think we'd all agree, all, all of us sitting here, we've learnt a tremendous amount from the whole COVID experience, and I think the whole island has, has learnt uh, a lot. But to say no on taxation, not really, because there were some exceptional circumstances. We were actually very surprised when the figures came through for cigarettes, that we, because we thought it, it, it might have affected. But of course, you then think that people can't be bringing in the duty freeze that uh, they obviously were before. Whether people smoke more is a difficult one to, to gauge, but certainly we weren't getting the duty free traffic that many islanders are, are asked whether they could bring back 200 for, for them. So we didn't see that. So it, it would be difficult to factor that in for later discussions, I think. OK, I'd have another follow-up question on mm. that about whether you're going to be taxing vape users next. But uh... it's, uh, it's, I was going to say it's in the pipeline, <laughs> but that would have been uh, a particularly bad pun. Um, it's something that's under discussion. It's something that's under review. But um, the health minister here, um, obviously, a lot of the cigarette tax and alcohol tax is brought about by, by the health um, policy lobby, yeah. or policy, yeah. as you say. Um, so uh, if it was proof that, that vaping was particularly bad for you, then I guess we would look at that. At the moment, I think there's still a body of opinion that it's better than smoking. So, um, it, it, I mean, there is an issue that's certainly been raised for me by parents who have been concerned around it and therefore thought it should be. Uh, there's also the query around, um, particularly if there's nicotine products within what you vape. At the moment, those aren't taxed. 
uh, as I understand it, and therefore, uh, so there is a piece of work that's happening, but there's no, nothing in this plan, so therefore it will go as a decision for a future council members as to what they want to do. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, we're going to move to our Slido questions that have come in, and um, Health Minister, you'll be pleased to see there's one on the uh, hospital now. So um, thank you for sending these in. I'll just remind uh, anyone watching that slido.com is where you need to go if you want to ask a question, and the hashtag is Ask the Ministers. And the first question is, the government will borrow significantly to fund the £850-plus million pound, uh, to, pounds to build the new hospital. Um, they've told us how we can afford the interest, but when and how will the taxpayer be paying off the principal borrowing, the £850 million. That's approximately £30,000 each for each taxpayer. Maybe that's not one for the Health Minister at this stage, but you might want to say something on it. Chief Minister? Okay. Um, whilst I'm talking, I don't know if, because we saw the question coming through, if the team are able to put a slide up that we were talking about, because that might be helpful. But... Um, uh, the point is, um, uh, at the moment, and even with the uh, potential risk of, of rates going up, we can borrow at very low interest rates. Uh, the returns that we get on the Strategic Reserve particularly are, Lindsay can correct me, but somewhere between 5 and 7%, depending uh, you know, which year. But that, and that's been going on for quite a long time. So what this graph is showing, if you look at the, um, the, the blue, basically the blue line, the dark blue line, there's two dotted ones which give a range is um, essentially we repay the from the interest. Uh, the fund continues to grow because, uh, obviously, as I said, the interest uh, we're paying out is less than the return we're receiving each year. And then actually we pay from, from that increase, bear in mind it's over you know, 30 and 40 years, um, you'll see two dips, two relatively negligible dips. And so essentially we're saying we can, uh, on average, over that 40-year period, our anticipation is that the reserves will increase and the um, and therefore we can pay the capital out of the reserve. So it won't affect taxation. Bear in mind, and particularly as, as inflation increases and things like that, and and with time, the value of that uh, of that debt, whatever that final figure is, let's say it's seven hundred million, will decrease. So seven hundred million now and seven hundred million pounds in forty years time is significantly less, but it's still the figure of 700 million, but it's worth less at that point in time. Are you happy with those assumptions, though? That are on the, yep. on the, on and the, the reason I, because I was challenged on that, and funnily enough, I went back, in fact, I went back to some previous recommendations about testing the returns of 2014, etc. And actually, when I looked, uh, the figure that Treasury had used uh, in terms of their projections at that time versus the reality, the reality was actually higher. So, uh, so I think from that basis, I have challenged. Now, let's be also be clear: it will go up and down. It's the average return; it's not returning in any one year. Okay. Health minister, you must be pleased the decision was made, rightly or wrongly. It's at Overdale, and um, if we were having this conversation maybe 12 years ago or 10 years ago, um, that was the site then, wasn't it? Uh, yes, it was certainly brought as, forward. As, le as legacy issues go, that's quite. And, and of course, it is a site that we use now for delivering healthcare. So we're very pleased, but I'm pleased for the staff who, who can really get on with delivering care for people, knowing that in five years' time, they'll be doing their job from a, a purpose-built uh, building that is gonna just be the, the, the best we can afford and is going to enhance care for islanders. And that's the right thing for us to have done. OK, we're going to return to a Slido question now from our audience. Um, and question here, why is the burden of tax revenue falling on the less well-off and the working poor when there's money that can be raised from other sources? These other sources are always overlooked, and it's about time we're all in this together. Um, Deputy Ash. Um, well, I, I'd be interested to know which other sources they would want to look at. Um, it's also fair to say that, it, that the tax burden doesn't actually necessarily fall on the, on the worse off. I think it's, I haven't got the exact figures here, but it's the top 10, 20% pay a huge amount of the tax of earners that is taken in Jersey. We also have uh, some of the highest tax thresholds 
Uh, I think if you look at Guernsey, they're sort of 11,500, the UK is around 12, as is 16,500. So we, we do try to have a threshold at the bottom, um, bottom level. Um, it, the GST is, a, is across the board, obviously, because that's a, a, a universal tax. But when it look, comes to income tax, um, it is certainly not the lowest that bear the burden. The, the burden is still borne by the, the highest earners. Politically, I'll say there are some people who fundamentally disagree and have a fundamental mantra that they want to see um, proportionately higher taxes landing on the higher yeah. earners. But as we've said, uh, in all this way, well, it, it, that tends to just lead to more complexity. And actually, at the end of the day, it makes you less attractive as a place to do business, which ultimately means you receive less money in the island, <coughs> and that has an impact on services. So, um, and we've always been very clear, even when things like GST came in, etc., the income support packages that came through were specifically designed to assist those at the very lower end. So, frankly, that felt a somewhat politically motivated okay. question, which I uh, think was wrong. The, the <laughs> discussion always around budget time is about those measures which, you could argue, affect people on lower incomes, not necessarily the people on the very lowest incomes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned GST. Now, we're about to see, well, in 2023, the aim is to lower the de minimis level on online um, retail from 135 to mm. 60 pounds. That's more than half, more than halving it. Um, I know businesses have been paying GST on things that they bring in for some time, um, and it's already an expensive island. You're clobbering ordinary people again. Um, I don't think we are clobbering ordinary people. We're, we're not. I don't think. I'm going to say we're clobbering everybody, but uh, it's it's a, a tax across the board. We're trying to help. It's not really fair on shops who are trying to compete with the likes of Amazon, and they are paying the GST here. And the likes of Amazon are, are at a certain level at the moment coming in for nothing. And that can't be a level playing field. And it's not fair on local businesses who we are trying to, to help. Um, so I think it's, it's just, it, it makes considerable sense. The EU are going to bring it in across the board. Mm -hmm. um, I think the UK will bring it in across the board. It will hopefully get to a stage where we won't even have to collect it. It will be collected by Amazon and then given to us. People understand the point about Amazon, the big tech companies that may do this automatically, as you say, collect it for you. But the smaller, smaller suppliers, that's questionable, isn't it? They're not going to do it. It's not going to be economically, make economic sense for them to do it. And they're just simply not going to supply to, to Jersey. Um, I, I think there's a risk with that. Um, well, there's definitely to risk. An ex, to it an already extent. happens. It, it, it does already happen to a, to a very small extent, to be honest. Um, but we cannot uh, completely put our whole government policy around one or two smaller suppliers. We have to try to be fair to on-island businesses, which I think is what we are doing. And I think if you talk to, to the um, purveyors here, they are not happy with things coming in online and paying no GST. It's, it's quite frankly unfair. Of course. People understand that argument, but it's also things which you can't get in the island. And even if you are a business trying to source supplies from elsewhere, they're already paying GST. Would you consider bringing them, a, if you're going to bring the de minimis level down to £60, bring it up for, um, for businesses? Um, I wouldn't say it's been considered thus far, because it hasn't. Nothing with the tax department since I've been there has ever been off the table. We're always, we always look to, to well, you'll see... Never, you'll never take a tax away if you've, uh, uh, once I don't you've introduced know. it. I don't know that that's necessarily true. There are certainly things that we, will look at, we can look at taking away and things that we will, we will look to modernise. So um, you are right. It's, it's probably a rare step to take tax away. <laughs> but it, it's always possible. And we do look to try and help business. I know it's not a popular view, but we do look to try and help wherever we can. Okay. Don't forget local businesses are generally employing, you know, local people. Of course. So, um, you know, if, you, if the view is actually you don't want to support those local businesses, there is a corollary, which means you're not and supporting those local people yeah. that get employed. Okay. Um, slightly more general question now um, right. from me. You're building on previous achievements of the Council of Ministers in the plan, aren't you? That's what happens every year, and you update it. Um, we're going into an election year, given the election cycle and given what happens smack bang in the middle of this political cycle, as in COVID, you're probably only just getting into your stride when COVID hit. Have you managed to achieve any of your ambitions as a government? 
or are you just pushing them on for the next government? No, um, we actually have achieved uh, rather a lot, to be honest, um, in terms of uh, uh, dealing with a lot of the legacy issues. Uh, actually, looking at Richard, hospital and mental health. Um, looking internally, um, uh, things like investment in the IT systems, which sounds really boring, but then gives you the ability to provide far better services to people, and given they were in a woeful state. Um, we've got a building that's going to be demolished next door to us, Cyril and that's been outstanding for 10, 12 years. Um, we've got, um, you know, uh, Treasury have introduced uh, independent taxation, and there's a lot of investment going to the schools. So if you look at that and actually um, so at the high level, there is a lot that has been achieved. What I think is a great shame is actually there is a certain quarter which only views the uh, perspective of what we've achieved quite negatively. I actually think we've done an awful lot as well as dealing with COVID mm. and Brexit, which should be, we should be fairly proud of. OK, another question uh, from those watching at home. Just how much debt is contained in this government plan? And more importantly, do you have a plan to pay for it all? Do you can I do the high level and you do the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. Um, essentially, there are three tranches of debt. Uh, there's the COVID debt, um, which is, um, uh, is less than we were projecting. That will be around 209 million uh, max. Depending at what point we crystallise that, if we do, uh, it will be less. And that's the one that what we've called the pre-YB, CYB uh, change, the change to the current year basis, uh, which should raise around £340 million will come in. So that's well covered, and that difference can then contribute to the other tranches. There's the debt on the hospital, which we've already alluded to, which is covered as well by the uh, returns on the reserves that we talked about. So in other words, we're borrowing uh, for significantly less than the average returns we've been getting on the strategic reserve for quite some time. And as we previously show, showed on that graph, uh, in 40 years' time, there is significant uh, ability on our projection to be able to repay those sums of money okay. very easily. And the third tranche is an existing liability. It's an existing debt in, in that terminology that we carry. Uh, we presently pay quite a high rate, and I'm being simplistic here, a high rate of interest on it. We're going to refinance that in the first 30 years. That will save us £300 million in the whole lifetime of that debt, which is as far away as 100 years, that will save us £3.6 billion. So short answer then, eat there are three tranches. Yes, we have a plan for each one. We believe they're prudent. And again, it shows the strength of the financial position we're on. Okay. Briefly. Uh, briefly. Um, I think, as John's just said, they were all very necessary. We had to borrow for COVID. Or we could have used the reserves. That would have cost us millions. Yep. So by not doing that, we saved the island millions. And that's another achievement that uh, John Pep didn't touch on. Um, we had to borrow to build a hospital, which was badly needed. The current one is not fit for purpose beyond 2026. And the savings on putting the pension in place will long term save us, I think it's around four billion pounds, is it? 4. 6, yeah, 4.7 billion yeah. pounds. So all three are very, very important things to do and will benefit the island tremendously. OK, we've got a couple more questions, uh, then we'll be moving on to our next topic, which is health. Um, Dave um, asks, this is an easy hit, surely, why can't you introduce heavier taxes on all vital activity going on in Jersey? I'm taking that one, unless you want to, you want to look at it as well. Um, I think uh, number one is um, it's a very easy comment to make. Um, in terms of buy-to-let, we split it between what I call external and internal, external being external investors buying into the island. Essentially, from um, an SOJDC perspective, we have we stopped that. We actually stopped that in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of dealing with the internal market, um, one's got to be slightly careful when we start messing around with the tax system and moving away from that simplicity, which is what that probably does. Uh, but equally, we, um, uh, you know, we are having quite heavy discussions around <coughs> what can be done, both short, medium, and longer term, to address the housing issue, which is what I think the uh, uh, the gentleman's referring to. If we're talking about capital gains tax, for example, uh, frankly, and and certainly that's the view we've had uh, from various stakeholders as well. It, it doesn't sit comfortably within Jersey as a, a financial services sector and also C, CGT, as I refer to it, is actually quite an inefficient tax to raise. So, um, uh, and, you know, uh, and that's been experienced from other jurisdictions, including the UK, that do it. Okay. 
Thank you. Right, we've had half an hour already. We're going to have one more question on this section before we move on to health and COVID-19. Um, what's happened to the efficiencies programme, which was talked about in previous years? Has the Council of Ministers given up tr on trying to make the government more efficient? You read it? Okay, yeah. right. A uh, short answer, it's still there. Um, <laughs> and we are um, project each year there is a requirement to make 20 million. Now, I referred in my earlier answer to the uh, office, what was actually the office strategy, Cyril and Marco House. Uh, the projections on that is that will save us uh, around 7 million a year when it is constructed. That's from 2024. So, the, in other words, the target for 24 to 25, depending when that comes through, part of that 20 million will be achieved through achieving efficiencies on property. It's part of the IT investment. Again, I think from memory, about 23, 24, again, should drive efficiencies coming through. Um, we've achieved, so the target for the first two years of the plan, so that's 2020 and 2021, was 60 million in total um, recurring. We've achieved or are on target to retrieve recurring about 55 million, which is, I think, a real positive tick. Uh, and then if we haven't achieved the recurring figure, the uh, arguments are it's what we call the plan ABCD even, um, and ultimately they have to get enough across the line as a one-off and then come back and readdress and try and achieve recurring savings the following year. That to date in the first two years we've achieved and obviously we're seeking to achieve that again. So the pressure is on there and actually it's a lot of the efficiencies that have paid for the growth that we've seen elsewhere. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to move on now, and I'm conscious we haven't yet spoken to the Education Minister, Deputy Scott Wickenden, who's waiting very patiently down the end there. We are going to have a quick swap round, so um, thank you very much to the Assistant Treasury Minister, Deputy Lindsay Ash, who was with us for the last half an hour. We're going to have a quick video now, but and when we come back, we'll be speaking about healthcare and COVID-19. Improving Islanders' well-being and mental and physical health has become even more pressing with the impact of COVID. Our COVID-19 recovery programme will focus on delivering key initiatives that allow services to return to pre-COVID positions. This will mean improving service delivery and reducing waiting lists, particularly for cancer screenings. We are establishing a new health and social recovery fund, which will support targeted and timely recovery projects across our community. We'll also be making further progress on our long-standing health priorities, including the Jersey Care model and our mental health improvement plan, ensuring we deliver excellent care and support that islanders deserve. Improvements have also been made to the services available to adults who suffer a range of mental health issues, including the launch of the Listening Lounge, the formation of a 24-hour crisis response team, a 24-hour community triage team, and 24-hour liaison service. There has been major refurbishment of acute care and outpatient facilities, and in addition, the launch of the Children and family, hu family Hub to allow access to early help and support. But we recognise that more has to be done, and this government plan will see £2 million spent next year on further improving the quality and access to the adult mental health services. Welcome back, and uh, thanks if you just joined us. If you would like to... Um, ask any questions of our ministers, please go on to slido.com and use the hashtag AskTheMinisters. Um, we have been speaking about the government plan and uh, we started off with half an hour on government finances. I'm sure we could have gone on a lot longer. Um, we are having to move on now, of course, to healthcare and COVID-19. Um, We've had a quick change of personnel up here. I'm delighted to say that uh, the Assistant Minister for a couple of departments here, Deputy Trevor Poynton, he's Assistant Minister at Health and Social Services and also Children and Education. So he'll be with us for the rest of the evening. A panel I've already introduced already, but uh, they'll, they'll be here for the rest of the evening to answer your questions too. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, directing this to the, the Health Minister, uh, Deputy Richard Renoff. And I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that it's been a hell of a year. Out of an 18 months, really, anyone in your position um, would have really felt what's been going on over the last um, 18 months. COVID-19 challenged our hard-working and dedicated health professionals like nothing else. Um, but there are, of course, other issues facing health, so I'm hoping we'll get to some of those in the next half an hour. Um, COVID-19, the new hospital project, will dominate everything, of course, but how will you ensure that the focus remains firmly on where healthcare is needed, i.e. primary 
health services, primary care? Primary care has an essential role in our health care because that is the first port of call that people, people go to. Uh, so we are working with our GPs and uh, pharmacists uh, in all the planning for the Jersey Care model because we recognise that uh, uh, we should no longer pursue a model that just drags everyone into a big building and uh, that, that's, that's past now. We need to be able to deliver care in the community and keep people independent in their home. Um, and GPs have a great role to play in that. And uh, we have good engagement with GPs and are working through uh, how they will de deliver that care in the future. I imagine that the health service is in recovery mode at the moment. Um, you've outlined the plan, but you've got backlogs in cancer screening, um, dental care for children. Um, what is, how, how, are you, how are you going to use the government plan to, to help bring that back on track? So you say yes, so I, I acknowledge that you know, many of our staff are, are tired. And they, they've worked really hard in stressful uh, times uh, uh, and, and we need to return to uh, a time as it was pre-COVID uh, when things were more orderly. But we are using uh, the extra investment in this government plan to, uh, to catch up on those waiting lists for cancer screenings and, and uh, children who've not had a, a dental checkup. We're uh, putting more resource into those, those areas uh, so that we will catch up as rapidly as we can. Let's go to our um, questions from our audience, and this, is, this stays with um, the Health Minister and the um, Assistant Minister for um, Health and Social Services and Mental Health. Um, are you aware of the crisis in the mental health care service in Jersey? And our questioner asks, 18 months waiting, there's an 18-month waiting list for JTT. Patients are saying they would rather end their life than go to, the, to Orchard House. Basic, uh, nice guidelines for treatment are not on offer for schizophrenia and bipolar. So mental health has been exacerbated by COVID. Many people have been affected in, in different ways. But our mental health services are in a far better position than they were some years ago when I became health minister. We now have a more stable workforce, more uh, permanent places filled rather than uh, employing agency or locum staff uh, uh, and we are able to Orchard House has been referenced uh, there have been huge improvements at Orchard House a very substantial refurbishment and therapies put in there and uh, you know, people that go there yes some are very ill uh, but we heal them, and I get letters that, that thank the staff, that thank me, I pass that on to the staff, for the excellent treatment that is given there. Um, so nobody need be afraid of suffering uh, an acute mental uh, health uh, crisis and, and not receiving the care they need, because we do give that care. According to the, the best practices, uh, we've got excellent staff who are committed to, to delivering care to the highest standards. Deputy Poynton, this obviously comes under your remit, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Uh, the Minister said uh, quite a lot about this. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. The fact is that uh, we're putting a lot of effort into improving services and in, in improving uh, wait, wait times and so on, especially for uh, uh, Jersey talking therapies where there was a, a, a massive uh, improvement in the middle of last year, but again, uh, that uh, has fallen back. But that is because the number of referrals coming into the service <coughs> uh, necessarily can't be met immediately by the current team, and the teams are being expanded. Um, it's not that we're not spe spending money on uh, improving the team's capacity, 
Uh, we're moving away from using agency staff. We're moving toward permanent uh, uh, staffing uh, positions so that we can provide uh, the service that the public so, uh, so, so require. And like all health services, the referrals are triage, so anybody needing urgent care is seen at an early stage. And uh, one of the successful measures that have been introduced in recent years is the listening lounge. That can take people with perhaps uh, a lower threshold of need, uh, and, and that has proved very successful. OK, we have got lots of questions coming in, so please, thank you for all those who've put their questions through. We will do our best to get through all of those, and there are lots of them. Um, when the Jersey Care model was taken on the road two years ago, there was a promise that it would be brought back to the public. This hasn't happened, even though the Director General said that she would do this by September. When will this be coming back, to, back for proper public consultation? Yes, and we certainly remember that, and we intend to... Uh, at the right time. I think we're still working through programs and plans and exactly how they would be delivered because the wonderful thing about Jersey is that we have so many care providers from those in primary care to the charitable sector uh, and we want to be able to present something that is, is very real and tangible to islanders. So that will happen. Now, um, other more questions coming in. Uh, among them, putting children first, Overdale, the William Knott Building currently has the Child Development and Therapy Centre. No replacement's been planned in the long term. Why is that? Yet another example, um, our questioner asks of that this government is not putting children first. Do you want to take yeah, that? Yeah, OK, I'll take it. Um, we are actually doing quite a, a great deal in relation to the... Uh, uh, th therapy centre and the staff there, as the public are probably aware, that uh, service is moving over to Kettler Kenneve uh, until the new hospital is built. That's not to say that we're going to move that facility into the new, new hospital. In fact, the service itself has made it clear they would prefer not to move into the new hospital. Uh, in, in reality, they and CAMS uh, do need new accommodation. Um, and they, we do need to consider over the next five years, and, and sooner rather than later, where that accommodation should be, what that accommodation should be, and we should try and accommodate those two services that are complementary in the same accommodation. They are both therapeutic services that need space, need uh, interview space, family space, and so on. And they, uh, we, we have a duty to provide that facility, that physical facility, for both CAMS and the uh, rehabilitation service. Have you, have you got anywhere in mind yet for where that would go? No, that will be down to uh, property holdings uh, and it will be down to uh, planning to see whether or not buildings are suitable and whether, whether or not uh, there is a building of a significant size or whether, whether there needs to be a new build. Uh, is, is, is the question we, we ask ourselves. Me, a child with developmental needs doesn't need to be brought into an acute hospital. We'd want to create something that is as good as the premises that now exist and that will give assurance to those vulnerable children. doesn't need to be in an <coughs> acute hospital. Um, Deputy Wickenden. Say because I've looked into this as well, being the children's minister, that, that, that when moving to Le Kenneve, um, all the same staff will be there because these are the children that don't deal with change very well, and we're, we're fully aware of that. So the William Knott Centre is beautiful, and it was done up in an amazing way and in a caring way for these children. We're going to provide the same kind of beautiful, caring facility with consistency in the staff to minimise as much as we can any disruption for those children. Um, but the disruption of a new hospital being built and, and the likes there would also be even more so I, I've been looking into this to make sure that, that all of the right checks and balances and care is being done while this moves because these children don't deal very well with change but but it will we'll change once and then we'll see where we go from there but 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 I'm trying to make sure that, 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 that the children are thought about and how to do this in the most careful manner okay different question now this is one that comes up often when talking about our health care model in Jersey. Why can't this wealthy island afford free doctor's appointments for everyone, like they do in the UK? Well, we <laughs> have taken one huge step 
uh, in recent times, which was a commitment in the government plan. Uh, and, and we have made available uh, doctor's appointments for those on income support and on the Pension Plus scheme uh, at a much reduced charge. Uh, and, and I think that may be a first step. And then we will look at other groups that may wish to, that we may wish to, to help uh, in that way. OK, don't forget, you can put your questions through on slido.com uh, and the hashtag there is Ask the Ministers. You can vote up the running order as such where those questions and how quickly they'll get asked by voting on there. Uh, I will do my best to try and get through and uh, we'll try and keep our answers as, or well, hopefully our ministers and assistant ministers here will try and keep their answers as short as they can because we do have a lot of questions to ask. And uh, next one, uh, what do you intend to do about the... Um, eight, uh, health and social services staffing crisis. It says, with reference to recent operations being postponed due to staff shortages, which a number of people blame on unaffordable housing in Jersey, which in turn is putting people off from coming here to work in health and social services. Catch-22, isn't it? We don't have a staffing crisis. We have, in fact, recruited more staff this year than have retired or, or, or left. Uh, but in some areas of service, there, there are pressures, and it happened that in our theatres uh, there was particular pressure because of sickness that had uh, arisen. And for a time we had to, to stop routine uh, 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 operations. Not urgent, uh, but um, uh, that has now resumed. And we, we are fully staffed in theatres once again albeit that we have some agency cover, um, uh, but the, the operations are, are proceeding as planned. But uh, looking at the wider picture, yeah, the, the challenges in recruiting in the island uh, do involve, yeah, people think cost of housing here, far too expensive, cost of living. Um, we are successful in HCS to, in, in developing our own. We, we train local nurses and we've got 54 trainees going through the, uh, the, the, the courses at the moment. We're training mental health nurses also. Um, so that's part of the answer. Uh, but uh, government-wide that is uh, an issue, how to bring people in uh, and, and keep them here, which we are attempting to, to address. But it's always a challenge and has, I think there will be challenges around that forever probably. In addition, uh, we are also training social workers and uh, teachers. Um, we're n making str strident efforts to uh, improve the availability of skilled individuals within our society. Um, and we're being quite successful at it. Um, what we need to do for the future is make sure that uh, we address as a government uh, the problems of uh, housing paucity and the cost of housing for those people who are essential workers um, and uh, that's something that needs to be addressed across the piece by multi departments and the other day uh, the uh, Minister for uh, Children and Education suggested in relation to certain issues we should have a gold command and we should uh, get people from each individual department be it infrastructure, be it environment, be it health, be it education, get them together to uh, collectively find a solution to the problem within our society. Okay, well, I'm sure we'll come back to that and certainly um, we will be returning to some of these issues tomorrow when we continue on our second session of um, looking at the government plan. Another question. Uh, many UK venues requiring proof of vaccination along with other countries for travel purposes will still not accept the new Digital Jersey COVID certification, despite the fact it uses the same technology as an NHS COVID pass, as it's still not actually an NHS COVID pass. Has this been considered? It's a COVID-19 question now. Yeah, so uh, I'm told that in the coming days, the UK is expected to join the EU digital COVID certificate gateway. So that will allow the Jersey issued digital certificates to be used for travel and domestic use across the UK uh, and Europe. Uh, it takes time for all countries to coordinate. Uh, 
but it happens step by step. That's why at some stages it's not possible to, uh, to sort of ensure that we can guarantee that people can visit, say, France and be able to use their certificates. But in time, as a matter of consultation, all these things do seem to get worked out and the different digital solutions come together that are but it's important for people when they're traveling to do the research and to, to work out uh, are they going to be able to access what they want to access in the countries they're visiting has it been a i mean usually when these solutions come out it's usually after people wanted to travel so you, this is happening after the summer season where we had different obviously different requirements depending on which country even in europe that you were you were um, visiting in italy for example um, they weren't accepting or you had well, we we we, we you, you you couldn't use the NHS one necessarily because um, it was in in English rather than Italian, but obviously so a lot of these things need ironing out, don't they? You, sorry, uh, deputy. Uh, yes, yeah. digital minister, I guess. Um, uh, they do still accept paper and QR codes. It's just the digital, and it's out of our control. We have put all the technology in place that will enable it to work with other countries. But as the health minister said, out of our control is when other countries will come on board with the legislation and the things that brings it all together. We're, we've been ahead of the game to get the digital ID out, um, but we're waiting for other parts out of our control to catch up. But I would say to take your paper uh, if you're travelling, because that will be accepted, and we are doing QR codes, but please print it out in case you have a technology failure on your phone for the QR code. Good advice. Okay, we're going to look. Uh, we've got a question now about cannabis. Um, what progress has been made to consider how legalising cannabis could benefit the island for health, for tourism, for the economy, uh, not to mention reducing the costs associated with enforcing current laws? Hmm. So work has been done around medicinal cannabis, the use of cannabis uh, medicines to, to uh, address healthcare issues. But this question is about legalising cannabis for recreational purposes, and that's not government policy at the moment. And we have done no work on that as a government. I don't think Jersey on its own should adopt that policy and be surrounded by jurisdictions where cannabis is still illegal for recreational purposes. I don't think... American states have done that. They're surrounded by states which are in that position where they haven't made it legal. I can't... Yes, I can't imagine the... Uh, well, I can perhaps imagine the problems of travelling between Jersey and the UK if, if one jurisdiction has it illegal and, 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 and one not. Um, the, the controls you'd have to put in place if you wanted to enforce that. Do you so, see it as inevitable? Because there was, it's taken quite a while for medicinal cannabis to become, to get to the state as it has. And whether it was you or your predecessor, to a certain extent, there was heels being dug in when this was being discussed mm. over the last... 10 years but, in the States. Now we're in a position where, you know, there are permits for people to grow it here. Uh, yes, which is a whole other area of interest, the, the commercial cultivation of, of cannabis for medicinal purposes only, though. Um, uh, but insofar as concerns, it's used medicinally. Uh, early on in my term, we were able to introduce that, and it can be prescribed locally. Uh, but uh, I think we have to move as a wider community, as a, as a British family, I think, rather than Jersey as an island, take that decision on its own to legalise recreational cannabis. Okay. Right, let's move on. Uh, stay with um, COVID now. Universal PCR testing at the airport is costing a huge amount. When will it end, Chief Minister? Short answer. There will be a press conference either on Thursday. I think it's on Thursday this week, and we'll be doing the latest announcement at that point. So I'll okay, so something, something's about I'll to change. I'll encourage everybody to tune in at that point. So does that mean we're going to have to start paying for it? You'll have to watch and see what comes through. Okay, thank you very much for that question. Um, Can I actually? Sorry, one thing I should say <laughs> is uh, there are, there are a variety of measures that are coming through. Um, and we've also got to keep, we are keeping an eye on getting through winter 
but we are also putting in measures in place which are reducing the cost of that testing process. Okay. Okay. No. no okay. So right. there is a change on the requirement. We're not then. considering okay. that at the moment. Yeah. Thank you. Um, does the health minister consider that he, you, you should uh, consider your position after re the release of the shocking report into operating theatres? On this, it says there, surely heads should roll. Perhaps not the right. Okay, I, think make, but I want to help the island understand that really running a health service uh, is so multifaceted. There are going to be areas that uh, we do well at at any one time and areas where there are going to be difficulties. And in connection with the release of the uh, performance report that came out some months ago, there was a lot of media interest in it. It showed that, you know, there are parts of the health service where, yeah, it's difficult. Uh, other parts uh, were improving um, uh, and, and doing well. And uh, I think it's important that we understand that uh, you know, there, there are risks which are being managed within the health service. It's not something that is just smoothly operated, uh, but something that requires a lot of work, uh, constant attention, to make sure that we are uh, adhering to uh, the best standards of care. Um, uh, and because there's so much work within the health service, there, there will be times when there are challenges, but we address those challenges and we are putting it out there, telling islanders, look, this is the situation. These are our figures. These are our, 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 our performance reports. Uh, and I hope that is going to help islanders understand how a health service works, how it manages its risks. OK, we've, I'm afraid, only got one time for one more question on this section, which is healthcare and COVID-19. We've had loads of them, and thank you for sending them in. We're going to be moving on to our next one shortly. But uh, final one on, on health. Um, from Dave, how do you stop nurses who are being trained in Jersey then leaving to work in other places around the world that have lower costs of living? Well, I wouldn't want to stop nurses, um, uh, but I, I think we have a good retention of our local nurses that we train here, um, but everyone is free to seek employment elsewhere. And of course, we recruit nurses into the island. Um, thank you, uh, Minister. So, building a new hospital is going to be a huge incentive for people to, to remain in a state-of-the-art facility uh, in which there'll not only be facilities best care for patients, but good staff uh, facilities as well for their well-being. Okay, well, thank you very much. We are rapidly approaching the last half an hour of this uh, session of Ask the Ministers and our first of two this week, focusing on the government plan. We've been speaking about healthcare and COVID-19. We're going to take a quick break before we move on to our final subject this evening, which is putting children first. Through this government plan, we are continuing to deliver on our commitment to put children first, making important investments into our children's education mental health services and by supporting our island schools. COVID-19 presented challenges in a range of areas, but we should be proud of our education staff for helping to keep our schools open and our children safe and their education prioritised. Notwithstanding the difficulties of COVID, 2020 did see the foundations laid for a significant programme of education reform and investment. And during 2021, we've seen the delivery programme start and build up momentum. The importance and impact of the programme will continue through 2022. The recommendations of the 2020 Early Years Policy Development Board will continue to put in place new approaches to increasing access to the quality of provision for the youngest children building on the increased hours secured for three to four-year-olds in 2021. We'll also be making funding available to deliver improvements to schools, education sports facilities and the Jersey Music Service premises. This plan will see investment in the physical and mental health of our island's children. 
a priority, priority that remains at the top of our list. We'll be providing additional support services that are targeted at those children most at risk or who may be at risk to others. We'll be increasing investment in the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, CAMS, and in 2022, we'll see the further development and embedding of the targeted youth support service. We will be concentrating on addressing the needs of those young people who've experienced significant disruption in their lives and for whom a dedicated multi-professional approach is essential. Alongside these important investments, the government plan will also put more money into children's dental health further education and support for children who English is an additional language. We will continue to put children first and ensure that their interests are represented and to listen to. Welcome back and we're moving on now to our putting children first session. It's the last bit this um, evening. Um, we've only got half an hour left and we have a question here who is monitoring these questions and they ask it seems some awkward ones are disappearing they are all coming in um, and you can vote up the questions that you want asked and they will appear uh, at the top of uh, the screen that we see and I will ask them so we move on to our final session tonight, which is on putting children first. Um, and we're going to go straight to the first question, actually, uh, from Dave. Um, and he asks, how can you be putting children first when families are being forced to use food banks and social housing rents are ridiculously high? Who'd like to go first on that one? Do you want me to go? So, um, yeah, the, there are some people that use food banks, which um, are, uh, uh, it's very difficult to find out for all circumstances why that happens because you can't ask them and they wouldn't want to reply or, or answer that question anyway. Um, as far as social housing rents, people on uh, income support, on low income, all of their social housing rent through Andium is paid for so we're not asking them to pay those rents. Um, if you're in a private sector we pay up to a certain amount um, uh, of rent but for income support your rent is covered within that. So. Um, I think that's uh, really what we're trying to achieve. Um, the, the rents are at 90% of uh, market rates. We try and keep that in, in line with, with the lower in that manner. So I feel that um, the question itself is quite shocking, but the reality is that we're doing our best to make sure that people who are on the lowest incomes with families are supported. You use the, use shock though, you use the word shocking there. You must be shocked as the minister for children that families are in this situation? Uh, yeah, it's not good for anyone to obviously be in a situation where they feel that they're under financial pressure and the likes, which is why we have the income support system in place and that's why I work with Deputy Judy Martin as the Minister of Social Security and her team uh, will always be willing to talk and see where we can help out. So where does this come into the government plan, Chief Minister? Um, in terms of there are Various measures we put in place, are if it's if it's families that have got into difficulties because of, for example, COVID, there are there is funding in place to help families come out of that. Um, if it's around um, other reasons behind it, uh, then obviously you know income support has been there for a long time, uh, and if it's other services that are required, there is investment both in the education and the health side to deal with some of those services. Okay, we're going to go on to our next question now, and I think um, Deputy Point in this one perhaps is for you. Putting children first, children who have to deal with social workers or CAMs seem to be faced with a sea of temporary locums, rarely get to see consistent care. How do you intend to attract qualified professionals to the island for permanent roles given the current cost of living here? Um, well, I have to say that that uh, perception of the current social services for children and adults is uh, inaccurate uh, because the, the, the services have in recent times managed to recruit permanent staff to improve the service. There are still some locums, of course, but they are very much reduced uh, the, 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 than they were maybe a, a year ago when something like 50% of the, the staff were locums um, or agency. Uh, at that, that, that level. But we've been very successful at recruiting permanent people uh, and that has improved the service tremendously and it improves the continuity of care 
for the recipients of social social work care. Can you back that up? Can you quantify how successful that's being? It's it's it's, of, it's often easy. It's often easy for government ministers to say oh, that's not the that's not the the picture when people ask awkward questions like this. Well, yes, I'm, I, I'm, I'm of course not out uh, in the clinical or the social work environment, but it does follow that if you establish a, a permanency amongst your uh, workforce, uh, with an, a workforce that has uh, skills at a level that is required, then you, your, your uh, service will improve, and the uh, service has improved over the last year. Um, if you want me to go out uh, onto uh, uh, the clini clinical round, then I can bring back more information for you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, seriously, an improvement in the numbers of staff and permanent staff, not agency staff, has improved the del delivery. Okay, we're going to, we've got a question here on a story that you may have all picked up on in the news today. And this um, is a question for the Education Minister. Um, and the questioner asks, would you comment on what action you feel the police should take following re revelations of allegations of rape and sexual assault at JCG and Victoria College? So, so I will say that the police uh, engaged straight away and went to all schools to see their assemblies to talk uh, with the youth service about such uh, matters to let them know what what the process would be if they came forward and and reported the uh, what's happening to them and give them some confidence of the confidentiality and the care. So the police already have been around the schools. They are talking. The youth service talking uh, in assemblies about uh, 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 well uh, sexual misconduct uh, and appropriateness. Uh, and we are changing. Uh, and and I'm working with the um, youth parliament um, to. to to, to look at how our PSHE curriculum can be changed to strengthen it because they feel it's not strong enough in this area. So uh, I say the police have done plenty to go forward and actually talk. And I don't, I, I do want to say, uh, I'm, I, I'm getting tired of hearing just about JCG. They're getting victimised and it's hurting the children and I want it to stop. Um, mm. it's, it's, it's a society issue that we need to deal with, not just this. I think most everyone would agree, but. It says something where a brave, a small but brave group of people at a particular school take the step of highlighting this issue, which is not a new issue, but one, as you say, has not been highlighted in the curriculum before. Mm -hmm. the, the school and, uh, came in for some criticism today, but would your department have done something similar? Would your department have commissioned a survey like this one? We, we do commission a survey every year. There's the Children and Young People Survey, which asks these questions. So it will be happening. Why did it take this one to bring these, these issues we, to light? It, this one was just a very public one because it happened so publicly, which is why it's there. We already, within our Children and Young People Survey, it's been running for a little while now over the years, these questions are asked within that survey completely anonymously. Um, this one was a bit more public, which is why this has come to the forefront. But what we want to try and let children know is that there are services like Yes and Couth and the police and um, uh, there's services within government that you can go to and report these or speak to them um, that's completely confidential um, uh, so you can feel like you're in a safe place to talk to a professional. Okay. Thank you for all your questions that are still coming in. We have just over 20 minutes to go, uh, so please use slido.com, hashtag ask the ministers. So another question, putting children first. Have, uh, you've got a state's Quango, um, states of Jersey Development Company, building just about nothing but luxury accommodation, such as the rise in development, rather than social housing, thus putting many families and their children in rental pro poverty. Again, not putting children first. I'm taking that initially, and then if Scott wants to come in afterwards. Um, I think the question has got slightly mixed up because the, there are basically a number of state owned bodies. Andium is the one that focuses on develop, uh, delivering social housing. Uh, and obviously, on top of that, other parishes. I suppose I should take off a different hat and, and the Housing Trust. Um, SOJDC is meant to be there to specifically to focus, originally was around 
specifically focusing on the waterfront, which is a mixture of a whole range of things, including public realm, including yes officers, and including housing, not necessarily social. Um, uh, although it is uh, incorporating affordable housing into, into its schemes. And as we said, we've shifted away from external buy to let as well. Um, now, the principle should be that that uh, um, entity is meant to get on and build and make a return, which then in theory should be reinvested in. Well, actually, it's meant to be reinvesting into St. Helier, which is about benefiting residents of St. Helier, improving the environment there, and that ultimately does impact upon children as well. So, um, and I think the point is, and I, I can't recall the exact numbers, but um, I think we've got between, um, uh, we've got certainly hundreds of houses, particularly coming through from Andium, uh, and units of accommodation that are in the pipeline. We've also taken measures by, uh, if we can nail down, we've nailed down the office side, hopefully we've nailed down the hospital that then starts freeing up brownfield sites which we can then put into the pipeline for future development. But there will always be a mix and there's always this argument. You either you, you can build on the valuable sites, you can only build on them once, and you take the return which is fulfilling a demand and then put it into, for example, social housing, or do you go straight to the social housing? But to date, using Andy as an example, there are quite a lot of houses, and I mean hundreds to thousands of houses in that pipeline for delivery in the next few years. So 800, I think, is uh, part of the plan that was... Uh, well, I think the trouble is there's, there's the island plan, there's mm. the, uh, sorry, there's the bridging island plan, there's, as you say, um, what to get delivered in the next year or so, and then there's, and there's the longer term, 2025 and 2030. And unfortunately, I'm, I can't recall the exact numbers according to which period of time, but there are significant numbers in that pipeline. Okay. Um, I will say my challenge, actually, which is partially around... Uh, island planning policies is, uh, for me, I've always been one that, provided you have the right quality of accommodation, that's critical, uh, I would be pushing to go slightly higher in certain areas. I think we're at that tipping point where we are going to have to do that at some point. Because if you, you know, if you take down, a, if you take 50 units off a scheme, that's 50 units have to be built, be built in the country because those 50 units are required. And I think we need to shift our mentality around that slightly to continue focusing on that delivery of units, which is critical. Okay, we are halfway through this topic, um, so there's only 15 minutes or so left um, before uh, the end. Um, so we have our ministers here and we've got plenty of questions coming in. Bob Jones, putting children first. Given it was one of the key recommendations in a, the long-awaited report by the Early Years Policy Development Board, when exactly will the government introduce free nursery care for all children under the age of five? So I'll take this one definitely. Uh, so yes, there was a policy development, uh, well, it was early years policy development board that made a number of recommendations. Um, we have now gone through those recommendations and I've asked my officers to start looking at how we can deliver those recommendations within the education reform program. There's also a cost associated with some of these. We have moved for 30 hours for children aged um, two, two and three. Um, and uh, the, the idea of moving to three to five um, has to be costed and, we're, and my staff are looking at how that could look, where the funding will come from, what it would look like. So that is being looked at as we speak. Okay. Um, how can we be putting children first when we have a two-tier society of private schools for the higher classes and public schools for those who are less well off? It's a different model to where other, say, the UK. So um, if we were to, for instance, uh, take all of uh, our funding from the private schools away, um, that would take the affordability for uh, education uh, away from a lot of families in this island, actually. And then that education requirement will still be needed to be met under the education law. That would push it into, private, uh, into public education. Um, I would worry that that would really stretch our schools. Um, uh, it is something that's being looked at about uh, where's the best model in this place, but actually the public-private um, model actually is cheaper for this island and delivers good outcomes. Would you have to build another school if you did it? Yeah, quite possibly, uh, if not two or three. Okay. 
So um, next question, why are we restricting children's travel by not giving them two vaccine doses or a certificate which says vaccinated if one dose is deemed sufficient? I think this is for the health minister. Yes, so uh, you'll know, Chris, that um, throughout the vaccination programme, we have followed the advice of the uh, Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, because that is where all the expertise is. And um, uh, at the moment, that committee and the medical officers of health in the uh, UK jurisdictions are saying that um, children should at this time receive one vaccination but the uh, the issue is under discussion with them uh, we think the 16 and 17 year olds are being looked at in a different light to the 12 to 15 year olds uh, so it may be that 16 and 17 year olds will at some time be offered a second dose um, uh, we have to let the uh, scientists work out the, the best way to look after children in, in this way and we will pay close attention to their advice. Uh, can I say there is no travel restrictions for children to do with whether they've got one dose or not? I wouldn't agree with such a matter either way so so I don't want to ever see a, a, a system on travel that says if a child's being vaccinated with one dose there's one rule and if they haven't then there isn't and that's not what we're doing so there are no travel restrictions due to vaccination of children and I certainly wouldn't allow it from our point of view. Okay, um, change of topic now. What is being done to avoid children entering the criminal justice system and once they have, what is being done to avoid them being stuck in a cycle of offending into their late teens to then be treated as an adult offender? And incarcerated. So there's quite a lot of work, uh, Chris, going on in this area with early intervention, which is really showing us the grassroots now. When we're looking at offending, there is now a, a two year gap of much lower offending at uh, younger levels. But of course, it wasn't in place for some of the children we have today that we have let down in the past that, that we need to work, which is why we've got the intent of youth support system. We've got uh, m m about five million going in to set that up here. Um, uh, we are looking at uh, the mental health issues, uh, youth services and increased funding across those things. So we're trying to now put in places much earlier intervention, much more intensive support for the children that we did let down to be able to support them in safe environments, uh, not putting them through the justice system, somewhere safe to be in the evenings so they're not looking at cells. So that work is going on right now. The money is in the government plan and work is already underway to make sure that happens. Okay, um, time as ever is ticking on. We are getting through your questions as quickly as we can. Um, another one now. Do you believe the Jersey Care model supports putting children first, in particular reference to the Child Development Centre? Uh, yes, it does support putting children first. Uh, we're looking at all sorts of children's conditions and how to address them without medicalising uh, conditions and bringing children in, into a hospital environment. Um, but we've spoken about the Child Development Centre, and if you want me to, to repeat, I think that's about developmental needs. And that service is, is valuable and is going to continue with the existing staff. Uh, and it will be at Lake Envey for the next five years. Uh, and then uh, a spanking new home will be found for it, good, as good as it is at the moment. Okay. Um, in practice, what does putting children first actually mean to the ministers? It's your number one priority, but our questioner says none of you have actually seen to be to believe it or be willing to put your policies where your mouths are. Chief Minister, start us off on that. Well, again, I'm frowning because, frankly, um, we know what the outcomes were from the care inquiry. We've undertaken to do a lot of change. We've also accepted, having said all that, that the children's services, for example, were in a, uh, a poor condition when we first started, and that these things take a long time to turn around. Um, we've got, actually, in fact, we were looking at legislation today, which is about improving um, uh, the, uh, some of the structures around uh, uh, how we look after children and their well-being. 
And as we've talked about, we've made quite significant increases, for example, in mental health, which was an election commitment and particularly aimed at, at young people. So I think, again, uh, I'm afraid I don't agree with the supposition of the questioner. I think we have actually done a lot. There is always more we can do. <coughs> but, um, uh, you know, that is basically saying we haven't done anything, which is something I fundamentally disagree with. And, uh, and you know, and then we go down the whole line about corporate parenting. In fact, I saw a fantastic well, piece about corporate parenting very recently. Okay, we'll go down the line. So to have some uh, <coughs> points, and you weren't, I don't think you were in the States when Frances Oldman, Oldham gave her final report. Um, are you um, putting children first? Um, most definitely. <clears throat> Pardon me, most definitely. Um, I wouldn't be working with CAMS and with, uh, as assistant to the children's minister. But I think it's wider than that. Uh, we are, when we develop policy, we're asking every department, every department, every minister, uh, to consider what the effect of the changes that are proposed would uh, make on children. How would it uh, advantage them or disadvantage them? And I think that's a very important move in a very uh, right direction uh, to make sure that children are put first, not just by the children's minister, not just by uh, the e education, but by the whole of the states of Jersey. That's an important development. It's almost in your job title anyway. Um, the health minister must be in yours too. It's incorrect to say that we don't believe in it. We absolutely do. There are all sorts of areas we could speak about, but um, we've put a lot of effort into addressing the needs of the children who are taken into our care. Uh, and, and when they leave our care, exactly how we look after still those children, because those of us who are parents simply wouldn't leave our children uh, at age 18 and uh, not still care for them. So that is continuing post-18. We have a, a package of care uh, for them uh, to ensure that they uh, are set up to uh, enter the adult world and be productive in it. Um, there have been changes. There's, there's so much more to do, um, uh, but we are working and we're committed to it. Okay. Got eight minutes. Uh, everything I do is about putting children first. It's my job. So we're, it, it's about putting in the intensive youth support services. It's about um, the education reform program and making better educational outcomes and parity of money and spending with it. It's the inclusion review. Uh, I, I, everything that I'm doing at the moment is all about therapeutic care homes for children to try and make sure that their the youth justice system's right. Uh, Everything I do is about putting children first. We put the Children's Commissioner in place. That was one of the care inquiry reports. Um, uh, I could go on, but I think you'd want to ask another question. OK, just a general one. Um, are all ministers united in their support for this government plan? Or is the Chief Minister going to be unable to hold his council together? We're not asking you that one first, <laughs> Chief Minister. So, Education Minister, we'll... we'll Go down the line from starting with you. Okay, yeah, uh, I absolutely um, am supportive of the government plan. We've worked very hard with all ministers and officers over the summer uh, during a pandemic at the same time to try and get it. Yeah, we're, we're supportive and I feel that we're doing the right. We've got an extra 35 million for putting children first in this government plan year on year. Um, we will get this through and over the line, uh, absolutely. Yes, this has been a collaborative effort. No disagreements at all. Oh, we've had disagreements. <laughs> we've had, we've had uh, some uh, robust discussions, but we arrive at, at uh, a plan. Our health getting enough of the pie, enough of the share. I, I'm very grateful for all the support I've had from, from ministers. Um, yeah, we, eight, year on year, health gets supported. Um, as an assistant minister, Deputy Poynton, you kind of step back from some of the Council of Ministers toing and froing, I suppose, in the meetings they have, and you can take a slightly more objective view, and you, st you stand in two um, departments. So what's your view on unity within the governing party? It is true I'm not involved in the uh, Council of Ministers' discussions, but uh, those discussions have proved very fruitful for mental health, adult, adult mental health, and for CAMS. 
Um, from uh, the beginning of this year, CAMS have funded £950,000 to uh, take on additional staff to, to meet uh, additional needs. And for 2022 and thereafter for three years, there's going to be 2.5 million additional funds put into uh, children's mental health. Um, and likewise, there are going to be funds put into um, um, the mental health pr provision in uh, health, uh, around two million to develop services that will bolster uh, young children and young mothers, uh, okay. well, not so young mothers as well. I'm really unkind, Minister. I'm not going to get you to answer that question, but you're going to answer this one in a moment. But we're going to go down the line again, uh, Deputy Scott Wickenden. Uh, most important commitment in the government plan? You've got 30 seconds. Um, so my ver most important is actually the educational reform programme in one act. I've got two areas, educational reform programme that's about helping children with English, additional language, special, educa need, special educational needs, lower pride attainment, and then there's the mental health and CAMS work that needs to be happening, intensive youth support. So they're my, in my two kind of areas, that's the bits that the, the government plan really means to me. What's health banking on in the government plan? It's the investment to catch up on our uh, waiting lists, which COVID affected, uh, including dental waiting lists and addressing children's needs in that way. So to point in, this is really unkind, so just pick one, one department, What's the, what, or something else which you find important. Well, we've, uh, we are intru we've introduced crisis intervention teams. We want to bolster those services and we want to get m adult men mental health and CAMS working much more closely together. And that, that in itself will sop up some, some of the money that's available. Okay. Chief Minister. I'm not going to give one. I'm going to say it's a, um, it's a whole programme we brought together. I think the balance is about right and I think it's about dealing with some of the difficult issues we've inherited, dealing with those legacies, whether it's mental health, whether it's children's, whether it's overall health, state, uh, state of the health service and the hospital and you name it, even with, um, you know, we have increased, we can always do more on environment, you name it. But actually doing all that within the context of, I think, a prudent and sound financial envelope. So dealing with the legacy issues, legacy issues and therefore setting the island up right for future generations. OK, well, panel, thank you very much indeed. That's all I'm afraid we've got time for in this first of two sessions on the government plan. We are back tomorrow with more and we'll have um, different ministers and assistant ministers in those seats there. But I must thank, first of all, the Chief Minister, Senator John Lafondre, uh, for joining us. Also, the Assistant Minister for Treasury and Resources, uh, Deputy Lindsay Ash, who was here earlier. Uh, the Minister for Education, Deputy Scott Wickenden. The Minister for Health and Social Services, Deputy Richard Renoff. And Assistant Minister for Education, and also for um, uh, healthcare too as well, um, Deputy Trevor Poynton. Thank you very much indeed for joining us.